Hi everyone, Grandmaster Ben Feingold here. Um, today I'm going to show a game that I show often um, when I'm at tournaments or, you know, if I'm walking on the street or shopping in the grocery store and I see somebody standing by themselves, I'm like, hey, let me show you this chess game. Um, I've only been arrested twice for showing this game, so I can't really show it too often in public now because of the third strike law. So anyway, if you've seen me at a tournament or anywhere in the post office, you know, and waiting for sentencing, then you've seen this game. This is my game with Boris Gelfand. And um, when somebody's not being nice to me, I always threaten to show them this game. Then they straighten up and fly right. Now, this game was played in 1989 in Amsterdam. Uh, it was a 28-player tournament, and I think I was rated 25th, something like that. And um, this is where I got my first uh, IM norm. And uh, if I'd won my last round, I would have got a GM norm, but uh, I got crushed. For some reason, I don't think I'm going to be showing that game in the videos. Okay, now this game was played in round five. Uh, I had three out of four. Uh, I lost to Judah Polgar, and I beat um, Paul Vandersteren, Gandhi Sasanko, and Rini Kaif, who were three of the uh, players in the Dutch Olympic team at that time. And uh, so in round five, I played Boris Gelfand. Boris had uh, four out of four, but he had played the other people who had three out of four. I was the only one left. So pretty easy pairing for him, um, except that I had white. Okay, so uh, a long time ago, I would say in the early 80s, we'll just say 83 for the sake of argument, because you got to say some year, uh, I played in a correspondence tournament, and um, I didn't finish it. But uh, in one of the games, I was black, and my opponent played queen c2, the queen c2 Nimzo Indian, which we see here. And, uh, and, and I, I got crushed with the black pieces. And ever since then, I've played the Queen C2 Nimzo Indian with pretty reasonable results. I've had some losses and some wins, some, some nice wins. And um, so this was uh, my, my opening probably that I knew the most. Okay, Gelfand played C5 and I captured. And um, in this position, I've had people castle, take the pawn on C5, play Knight A6. Um, Boris played Queen C7, which I haven't faced before since. And the idea is to stop uh, white from playing bishop f4. I can still play bishop f4, but it would lose my bishop. Um, I never play bishop f4 in these variations, so that move doesn't really hinder me. OK, knight f3, bishop c5, bishop g5. And um, in this opening, white has an option at many points of playing either e3 or e4. And I almost always play e3 because I like to block the bishop. And I like to have the e4 square available for my pieces if, if need be. Um, e, e4 seems to gain more space, but it but it weakens the dark squares a lot. So, yeah. Okay, it's like we're playing Go. All right, so played a6. And basically what he did was he played a hedgehog um, where he's down a tempo or two because he's made several bishop moves, uh, bishop e7. And we develop our pieces. And position looks pretty boring here, actually. And I doubled rooks on the D file. Okay, and this is a, this is a, I don't know, equal position maybe. Maybe white's a little bit better because I have the D file. I think the computer says I'm up like 0.2 or something, 0.3. But uh, I assume uh, most strong grandmasters wouldn't mind having black here. Maybe they would prefer white, but it's not a big deal. So black has the typical hedgehog structure where all his pawns are in the third rank and all his pieces are where they normally go. Um... And white's position isn't too normal for a hedgehog like that comes from a c4, c5 English. But in the Nimzo Indian, this is, this is where the pieces usually go for white. Um, doubling rooks on the d file probably isn't very common, but I would like to put pressure on his d6 pawn since it's on a half open file. Okay. And um, according to the engines, this is where Boris made the losing move. Uh, well, okay, black should just castle. And um, unfortunately for him, he did castle, but he castled the other way. He, he played long castle. And uh, this, isn't, this isn't as good. So normally when you castle in chess, you're doing two things. You're making your king safe and you're activating your rook. Well, his rook on d8 is better than on a8, but his king is less safe on the queen side than it is in the center or the king side. Um, and I think... The problem was he felt that he had to win this game. He had four out of four. He was one of the higher rated players in the tournament. And um, I think uh, um, 
since I was one of the lower rated players in the tournament and I, I wasn't even an IM, I was an FM. So he probably thought this was a good chance for him to get 5-0. and And if he castled King's side, maybe the game's too boring and I would have good drawing chances. But now a draw is not a very likely result because we castle opposite sides and we can both play interesting chess and hopefully I'll make a mistake. Unfortunately, his plan didn't work because it was too easy for me to play. So I played b4, going for the attack. Played h6. Normally, when my bishop's on g5 in a queen pawn opening and my opponent attacks my bishop with h6, I go back to h4. But it seemed like I could gain a tempo by playing bishop f4 here because my rooks are doubled and now I have three guys attacking his d-pawn. Um, it's not easy to defend either. Uh, knight e8 is pretty passive, moving the knight to b8 or f8 so that the... Oops. All kinds of, all kinds of mistakes so that the rook can defend. That seems a bit passive also. You know, I, I thought the next move he played was really bad, but actually the engine plays it. But uh, it, it is something you don't want to do. It's a move e5. It really weakens the white squares. But, uh, I mean, he has to save his d-pawn. Okay, and g5. Ooh, I'm scared of that attack. No, I'm just kidding. Okay, so a4. And um, I made another bad move. Uh, he needs his rook on d8 because I have a lot of guys that are sort of pointing towards the center here. And so his rook on d8 is pretty well placed for that. And he played rook to g8. He doesn't really have an attack, and his rook on h8 is just stuck. So that's also not a good move. Okay. I played a5, busting through, sacrificing material to get it as king, and then c5. And um, my intention actually was, if he takes the pawn on c5, was to play b5. If you play a5 and c5, you might as well play b5. And um, I put this in the engine within the last year, and it said that white's completely winning. I mean, I have a big attack. I'm threatening a6. His king is not so well defended. The e5 pawn is weak now because his d-pawn is missing. And I have the open file, and he doesn't have any attack. So my judgment was correct in this particular case. So I played c5. He didn't like that, I guess. So he played g4, getting a counterattack. Um, I guess I could just move my knight, but I took on d6, hard to resist. And then after he got his piece back, I took the pawn on a6. And um, yeah, this is already completely winning for white because my attack is crashing through. And because of my strong bishop on g3, which blocks the g file, and because of his silly rook on h8, which isn't participating in the game, pretty easy win for white. Um, I think it's really high numbers now in the engine, although I haven't checked in a while, but they're, they're pretty bad. Uh, he traded on a6, and he played for tactics by taking uh, the pawn on b4. Now my knight's attacked, and it's pinned. So I can't move my knight because he would take my queen. Okay, and I have a nice tactic here with rook a8 check. So he has three legal moves, knight b8, queen b8, king b7. King b7 loses for a nice reason. So if you haven't seen the game, which means you, I guess, are a newborn baby, and somehow you're watching my chess video. Congratulations. Um, pause the video. If you can't pause the video because you're a baby, have you know your parent do it. And try to find the winning move here for white. Okay, so we actually have two tactics in one here. We do a skewer, rook a7 check. And if you don't want to lose your queen, well, you should probably be playing another game because you're going to lose your queen now. King takes rook, and knight b5 is a fork. And a discovered attack. So king b7 doesn't work. Queen b8 is obviously silly. So he played knight b8. And now earlier, I didn't think e5 was a good move. The computer did. And since my knight is pinned, I can use these two ideas to my advantage. I can unpin my knight and take advantage of his weak white squares by playing queen f5 check. And once again, if he plays king b7, then rook a7 check wins his queen just like it did previously. Uh, this knight's pinned. Queen d7 is a terrible move because I have a rook on d1. So he resigned here. Uh, he could play knight d7, and every move wins. Knight b5 wins, knight d5 wins. Um, I was going to play bishop takes e5, and the idea is the knight can't take because it's pinned. And if he takes with the queen, then I play queen takes d7 checkmate. Nice checkmate. 
and um, you can throw in this rip g2 check, but that doesn't really do anything. Just checking me. Um, if he loses queen away, then I have two different checkmates here. Um, I can play rook takes check. He can't take with the knight because it's pinned again. Just take with the queen and then mate. And for those of you who like queen sacrifices, uh, I can sacrifice my queen. This is the only move. And then mate. So my intention after knight f to d7 in this position was to play bishop takes e5. And that's probably the best move, the quickest way to win. But because my knight's not pinned anymore, as the arrows indicate, the, all the knight moves win because his king is just totally naked. Um, and again, his rooks are, are useless. So that was a nice victory for me. That gave me four out of five uh, against five higher rated players. Um, I was actually... I think I gained 45 FIDE points that tournament, and the K factor was either 10 or 15, so I actually got a pretty good score. Um, I broke 2,400 for the first time that tournament, and I think I was I was 19, yeah, because it was in July of 1989, so I turned 20 in, in, uh, in September. And also, 89 was the year that I got married for the first time uh, in January, so... Uh, yeah, interesting. I was living in, in Brussels. I was playing chess in Amsterdam. And uh, that was an interesting life back then. It seems like three or four lifetimes ago. Well, again, try to donate to help our chess center, uh, atlchessclub.com. It's in the notes everywhere. You can just click on it in the description of the video. Please like and subscribe to my YouTube page. I think we have almost 3,000 subscribers now. Hopefully we'll get to a much higher number by the year's end. Um, go to my Facebook and Twitter, which is the Chess Club and Scholastic Center of Atlanta. It may be abbreviated CCSCA. Um, and uh, yeah, like that. Okay, I hope you enjoyed that video. And um, I hope that you've seen my game with Gelfand at least 10 times. I've seen it at least 100. So uh, yeah, even, even Boris is getting sick of it. And he's never seen it. All right, thanks a lot, guys. Bye.